but to see them as a resource and to include them in. So we are very, very pleased in South Africa to have a very good, sometimes quite combative, but that's fine, NGO sector. All of us are really on the same page. It's just that we just need to find each other uh, in that. So the NGO sector for us is really important. And we're very lucky in South Africa that we've got a strong NGO sector uh, in the environment. Um, it is valuable having a national science-based organization set in national leg legislation, accountable yet independent, dedicated to biodiversity conservation, and spanning the arenas from science to policy. It, it is very useful. Um, we harness these vast collections of biodiversity data. And so, for example, in South Africa, we have our, uh, our animal collections. Plant collections, we, we, we more or less have that in line, but the animal collections, dead specimen collections, for example, are scattered in 40 institutions in South Africa, ranging from local authorities, towns, departments, personal collections, etc., our national collection. So there's a vast amount of data, and as Town says, the data is not the problem often. The data is lying there, getting dusty, and in cases of dead specimens, rotting in places. It's the information out of that data, the, the dishing up of that data to form information that is missing. Um, so we are quite a unique institution. It's not, we're not so, um, uh, there are not many other institutions like us. Um, we've been engaging with uh, Conabio in Mexico. Um, the Humboldt Institute in Colombia, the InBio in Costa Rica, the Indians have been here, they have a very interesting model. They have in their legislation that at local authority people must collect biodiversity data. There is biodiversity data lying in every municipality and city in India they are unable to convert that data into anything useful. Here's an example of how if you just collect data very well, I mean very, uh, uh, what do you call it, the person they, with good intention, uh, they've trained people, they have data. Uh, so in my next life, I would love to go and get that Indian data out there. Um, uh, you could have, you can have a copy of this presentation. I, I just had a little, some of the other challenges that uh, biodiversity institutions have, uh, I think. And I've talked a little bit about whether we are leaders in science or leaders of science. In other words, are we uh, setting the agenda of science or are we doing the science? And that's always a battle. Turning scientists into communicators and strategists and packagers and relationship managers, that is a uh, challenge, uh, often not the skill set. Human backlog I talked about. The other thing that is a challenge for developing country institutions like ours, town, is the issue of, we talked about this last night as well, is the issue of long-term research and quicker research. Um, and the combination of research as in terms of surveys and assessments and monitoring, you know, some of the conceptual thinking about research where you sit for three years, four years and do a project of which the outputs come out when everybody's either dead or gone resigned or retired to a faster turnaround research, which answers questions quicker than the old ways. So last night we, we talked a lot about the 
14th, 15th century notion of doing a PhD in the way that institutions globally see PhDs or, or globally see research capital develop, capacity development and how it just doesn't work for the majority of us in, on the world. Um, so it's an issue that we have to deal with in institutions like ours. Uh, you can't afford to have people doing blue skies research too much. You can't afford them doing their pet thing. Uh, you, they, and, and you can't afford that they stay forever, 10 years, and they haven't done the Ranunculaceae family yet, you know. Uh, and then in the end, what is the value of having so much effort on the Ranunculaceae family? So it is a problem. Development imperatives I've talked about. You have to include a job creation or poverty alleviation in any work we do, in any institution building in, in this whole continent. You cannot have those institutions without thinking about uh, that. Um, and then of course, you have to manage the fact that biodiversity conservation in all our countries, including in the north, will be seen sometimes as in conflict with development, in conflict with progress. And so that's another area that you have to work on. So I talked a little about cooperation, income generation. So the other, you must tell me when to stop. Guys, I could go on forever. Let's take a short break for some tea. Okay. But you, you've got the floor to, 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 Yeah, I just don't want people to fall asleep. You must also tell me when you need a bit of body break. And I'll try and find a, a, a point at which I can stop. You, you choose a, okay. a break point and we'll, All right. we'll take a break. So, I talked about other challenges for a national biodiversity institution. Um, Long-term research versus short-term, talked about that. Quick turnaround research versus sitting for years uh, looking at the leg of a frog. Um, cooperation versus competition, not only in-country but also within countries. Um, for an institution like ours, and you will also have that, is the issue about income generation um, versus science priorities. Because in the end, an ins if you want to build an institution, you need to build some kind of sustainability in it. And in a way, sustainability often can be seen as can you generate income. And so the issue about payment for information and open access of information. Uh, it's a noble cause that all information should be open to everybody. But at what point can you begin to charge, for example, if you analyze that information and produce packaged information that's useful for the private sector, for example? Where in that line? So this, that's another uh, uh, debate you, you will have to have. Because while I'm a strong believer that as a Miss Citizen, I should be able to go in into a public website that has been paid for by my taxpayers' money to see information that is being generated by my taxpayers' money. What I also do think is if I'm an oil explorer and I want to get, get information about a particular area and I want you to do analysis and give me detailed information, I need to pay. So it's an interesting line there. And there's a difference between providing a goods and services for the state and for the public and goods and services for a client. And in a way, as a public entity, you provide goods and services for a client, you feel a little bit tainted, like you're selling yourself. But on the other hand, the private sector are major players on our continent. And so how do you provide good information, true information, veracible information for a client like a, like a mining company 
get them to pay it, pay it for it without selling your soul. But on the other hand, one day when your government decides that they've got another priority and they cut your budget, then the whole house of cards will come down anyway. So that's an interesting area that you have to also work around in, in terms of uh, an institution. Um, I worry about this period we are going through. Um, and I think in 20 years time when we look back, some of us will still be alive hopefully, when we look back, we will see the negative impact of this moment of economic downturn on our sector as research and understanding. Because we've gone through quite a boom period globally in terms of funding and it has given us the luxury to do things we normally wouldn't have done to do research in areas which were not considered to be priority for development or priority for social, economic or political uh, aims. And so with the result, we made lots of new inventions and new thinkings and new thoughts. In the time of budget constraint, and I, I want to just give you an example of a budget constraint, the UK Environment Department cut the budget on biodiversity by 40% one year two years ago. 40%. Choop. So retrenchments, infrastructure, all those kind of things. So, which meant that the biodiversity institutions in Britain, like Kew and other Kew Gardens, etc., had to retract their work quite suddenly. And so while you want to focus 90% of your work on the needs you can see, it would be nice to have 10% focusing on the areas you can't see, what they call blue sky. But lately we don't, we're not even able to do blue sky. And I think that will have an impact going forward and maybe we can discuss that. And then of course the challenge is to have these findings packaged in a way that communicates and so you have to have the role of knowledge brokers as well. So in an institution like Sanby that starts out being a research institution, forget the gardens for the minute, research institution, moving towards being relationship managers and the next real um, uh, challenge for this institution is to become uh, knowledge brokers, knowledge disseminators, information disseminators, and we also don't have the we don't have the the, the skill set. So th that's that's part of the challenge. You can't have you must have all of them in order to make it work. Um, yeah, I think I've made that point. So, uh, in talking about institutional development and in talking about where we position Sanby uh, amidst others, we came up with this triangle uh, to make us understand where in this triangle should we sit as an institution. And it was actually quite a good tool for us to to understand ourselves. So we sit in the data, the data generating portion. But the power of a data generator only is actually very little. And when I say power, it is position, your position is good, your status, and therefore your ability to attract money, good people, etc. As you move up that triangle, with, this is the discussion we had, in theory, we should be getting more powerful. We should have more political influence. We will have more profile. We fall just short of that policy line. We are just behind that policy line. We've decided not to go as far as policy. 
we leave the department and the other and other people who have got access to our information to do the policy so that was quite a good decision that we would go right up against that line we would provide tools and information right up against that line we'll even facilitate those tools to go into policy but we will not be policy makers and that was a good thing also as an institution to understand where you play along that line. I talked about other institutions um, and that I think is my very many ideas about uh, institutions. Sorry it went off. I think I switched off. So we didn't need a break. It's good to 12. Um, just to say that uh, also in the pile of things, we, as I said, we celebrate our 100 years. Uh, and so we did 100 years of science. And so that's it's quite a nice thing. We did an exhibit and exhibited all our young interns and the science that we do, etc., etc. So that's also there. Um, and really, I'm open to any questions. A little bit all over the place in many ways. It's a journey, actually. It's a journey of learning. If you'd asked me to do this talk four years ago, it, I would, it would be a very different, different talk. It's really lessons that, have, that we've learned in Sandy over the last uh, nine years or 10 years or so. Um, and things that we grapple with all the time. So it's a good idea just to talk about and have it out in the open. Uh, when you are developing an institution of this kind. Okay. <laughs>